This is episode 21 of the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. Welcome to the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. I'm your host, Sergio Millis, and each week I'll bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover how to break in and succeed in sports and life. Thanks for spending some time with me today and let the experience begin. This episode is brought to you by Sports Business Classroom 2020, an immersive sports business training and educational experience unlike any other, taking place July 12th through the 18th in Las Vegas during Summer League. Registration for the program opened last week, and ladies and gentlemen, you do not want to miss this. It truly is a -a one-of-a-kind learning opportunity for anyone interested in the business of basketball and jobs in sports in general. I mean, if you dream of one day landing a job in sports, are passionate about learning, or simply want to show the right people that you have what it takes to get a job in sports, this program is for you. Sports Business Classroom combines the best of all worlds into a single package. It's great academics, it's hands-on experience, it's immersion in the Las Vegas Summer League, and it's interaction with some of the best minds working in and around the NBA. You can check out all the details for the 2020 program at sportsbusinessclassroom.com. And if you're at all interested, make sure to apply as soon as possible as this program will fill up. Again, the URL is www.sportsbusinessclassroom.com. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your host, Sergio Millis. Today's episode, like our last episode of the Sports Business Classroom audio experience, is a little different than what you'd normally expect from the show. Today's episode is the audio from a recent Sports Business Classroom web show hosted by NBA TV's Bo Estes, featuring salary cap expert Larry Kuhn and the Athletics' South Partnow. Our guests talk about different ways the NBA could potentially make up for lost revenues, how the league could potentially handle free agency, and the NBA teams they believe have the most to lose or gain if the season is either extended or canceled. This was an incredibly insightful conversation that those of you who love the business of basketball will undoubtedly learn a lot from. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hi, hello, and welcome, everyone. My name's Bo Estes, and you're watching the Sports Business Classroom web show where each Thursday we get together with a group of industry experts to discuss the issues that are affecting both sports and the NBA. And this week we have three gentlemen closely associated with our program. In fact, nobody more closely associated with it than Larry Kuhn. He's the man that runs the Sports Business Classroom program. He's the GM. Larry, how you doing, bud? I'm doing great. We got the gang together for this show. I love it. Hey, but I got to tell you one thing. At least once during this broadcast, we have to prank call Dave Dufour. I think it's a rule. Maybe, maybe it becomes a tradition mm-hmm. starting this week. I like it, Larry. And since you're the GM, you can make those sort of rules. Okay, consider it a rule. Consider it. Moving a rule. on now, Eric Pincus <laughs> is a salary cap expert. Before Larry gets out of hand, he contributes to Bleacher Report, Basketball Insiders, and the Hollywood Hoops podcast. I've seen him around NBA TV as well. He's an instructor with SBC. How you doing, Eric? So it looks like we're having a little difficulty with Eric, who's sort of bouncing in and out there. Let's move on to Seth real quick, and we'll get. Straight with Eric. Just, there you are, Seth, looking good. Uh, the former director of basketball research for the Milwaukee Bucks, a current contributor to The Athletic, now also hey, working with SB. You're doing great. Thanks for having me and on, gentlemen. on top of that, he deals with Dave Dufour all the time. How you doing, Seth? I'm doing no well. I, I support uh, prank calling Dave whenever possible. <laughs> of course you do. Uh, let, let's move on real quick. Just a little more on SBC. Uh, the Sports Business Classroom, obviously, it's an immersive training program an educational experience that pairs with a summer league. Go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com to apply today. You can also catch archived episodes of this show and our audio experience hosted by Sergio Milas. So you're going to want to go over to sportsbusinessclassroom.com. And guys, before we get going, I want to thank the first responders who are trying their best to keep us all safe. They're really risking themselves. So we appreciate what they are doing and also those youth sports programs, all those coaches, those those kids, all those people that run that that system, those youth sports operators, we're thinking about you. We miss you, and, and we know that we'll be getting back to normal when we see all of you guys out there doing your thing as well. So let's, let's hop in right now. Uh, NBA teams are planning to come back 
Uh, Larry, let's start with you. What are what are you hearing uh, about these teams as they start to come back? I'm hearing the same things everybody else is hearing. This is this is unique. This has never happened before. We're in uncharted territory here. So people are cautious. I mean, the NBA itself is risk averse. And I think that's especially going to be true in this situation because we have to, to weigh the cost benefit of this, right? The benefit is us, we get we get society back. We get basketball back. We get our activities back. The cost is the virus does not care. And everything is a trade-off. So if we come back too soon, we come back in the wrong way, this thing can come roaring back. So every day can be measured in terms of a body count, practically. So where is the league going to say this is an acceptable risk where we think that we have looked at all the, the ways of, of all the risk, all the ways of mitigating those risks, and we think it's safe, not only for the players, but everybody it takes to put on a game of basketball, put it on, broadcast it, um, host it, everything around that. That's that's going to be tough. Nobody knows the answer. There's no perfect answer here. It's where are the trade-offs and where's the point where you say, okay, and then what are the triggers where we're going to say, uh, it's just not working out, we have to back off. Seth, Larry talks about walking that fine line about, about when to come back, the risks versus the benefits and everything like that. From a team standpoint, what do you think teams are thinking about in terms of those risks and those benefits, and how, how long will they need to get back up and running and ready to play in your mind? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, in terms of back ready to play, just from a quality of play and – uh, athlete safety, like aside from the the, the broader world, I, I can't see them them being able to get back like into actual game action in under three weeks, and I think that's probably pretty aggressive. Um, again, the, the 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 conditioning level needed to play actual NBA games is is pretty high, and that's you know in in these circumstances, I don't think that that uh, it's reasonable to expect uh, every or even most players to have been able to. To maintain that sharpness uh, in terms of of what I'm hearing, I think that uh, the folks I talk to are more on the, the kind of the operational level, the, 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 the analytic space. And uh, I think everyone is desirous of getting back to play. I think there's a broad split of opinion um, in terms of when and how that's going to happen, whether it's going to be a uh, complete regular season, whether it's going to be the 2020 playoffs whether it's going to be some version of just starting uh, 2020, 2021. 20, uh, um, there's a, uh, certainly at that, the the day-to-day -day operations level, I, I think that there's uh, for, you have, a, you have the, the, the number of opinions as people I've talked to um, and, and no real rhyme or reason at, between uh, the pessimists and the optimists. You, you'd think that the people who are most optimistic would be for the uh, work for the better teams, but it hasn't really, broken out that way. There's been people uh, who who work for lotto teams who think we're coming back and teams that are work for contenders that uh, that think that uh, that this season is is not going to get finished and we'll start fresh next year. Quick follow up on that, Seth. What are the smart people that work in analytics doing now to use their time to try to get out ahead of the curve? So when we do yeah. come back, maybe they've gained an advantage. No, that's uh, I, I'm glad you asked that. One of the, the, the biggest things is I think uh, they mostly just want some kind of certainty as to what they should be working on. I mean, are you doing playoff prep or are you getting ready for the draft? I mean, it's 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 so so those are sort of the the pathways we can we can kind of go down here. And it's a little bit of a little bit of limbo. Like, do I do I start my offseason stuff now? Do I? Uh, am I am I starting to to create the uh, the dossiers on on who we might play in the first round, or am I turning the page and and you know draft modeling and 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 looking at, at free agency and you know the the normal kind of seasonal rhythm of of the calendar has obviously been completely upended by this. All right, so uh, what this all means, I guess, at the end of the day is is that there's going to be a decline in, in basketball revenue for the NBA. So, Larry, how does that impact the cap, and what does that all mean for free agency as we go forward? 
Sure. Well, let's talk about it in terms of this season first, right? Because the players in the union, I mean, the, the league in the union have an agreement, the CBA, that says how they divide up the revenues. And the players basically get half the revenues coming in. It's anywhere from 49 to 51. And that determines how much they collectively get to the dime. So when revenues go down, the players' share of the pie goes down, which is why they came up with an agreement with the union this year to start withholding a bigger share of the money in escrow because escrow is there for fine tuning. It's just like taxes. We're going to withhold an amount. And then when you do your taxes, we figure out exactly how much you keep and how much the government keeps. Same thing with escrow. We're going to withhold an amount, keep it in a pot. And then at the end of the year, when we know what revenues are and therefore what you all get collectively, we'll figure out who gets what. They had to make a bigger pot this year because of that, because they expect revenues to be down. I don't know the amount, but I would imagine, and it also depends on whether we actually lose games to television. It could be north of a billion dollars, maybe even more. So that that's what happens this year. Now, next year, by default, they base what they think will happen next year on what did happen this year. So they take the revenues, they they, they figure out what the TV revenue is next year. They add a normal bump to that. And then they that's called their projected BRI. And then they set the salary cap based on that. That's out the window next year, obviously. But that's the easiest thing for the league and the union to do is to say, all right, we're going to use this hard number for projected revenues because it's a unique situation. We can't base it off of last year. So presuming number one, that we start a season and have a full season and have it on time next year. And number two, there's no huge dip because we are not feeling the after effects of the pandemic. And we think that revenues are just kind of go back to normal or close to it. The salary cap may not be affected a lot next year this could be an isolated thing that's just affecting this year so seth i asked you about how how teams are viewing this and how it works inside of teams as you look at free agency given what larry just said how are they forecasting ahead and how are they viewing the free agency that comes in 2020 and 2021 um my guess is that that teams are going to be very cautious. I don't think there's going to be a ton of free agency money out there this year anyway. Um, and I think that, um, uh, let me back up and say that, you know, within teams, they have people who are, you know, kind of looking at many different scenarios for where the cap will end up. And, you know, they, they come up with kind of a range and for ease of decisions, probably, you know, a, a papa bear, mama bear, baby bear kind of scenario where are these, you know, where, where's it going to be? And let's, let's kind of, you know, okay. And think that, it's that gonna goes be the on throughout the year, right? That's that's an ongoing yeah. mm-hmm. device process. Sure. No, I mean that's something that started. You know, obviously that that's something that's been ongoing this year. I mean, starting with the sort of the um, the 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 impacts and fallout from you know Daryl Morey's comments about China and the reaction to that, and then um, I don't I don't know the details. Maybe you, you do a little better, Larry. But the the uh, the Microsoft deal that was just announced that that probably has has some impact on on, on revenue at some point. Um, uh, so, but I think, um, even working with the assumptions that, that Larry just laid out for what they could peg the cap at for next year. Um, I think that there's some like, you know, looking, you know, broader than just basketball, there's obviously some downside risk to, um, you know, what the, what does the broader economy look like and how does that affect revenue? So even if you kind of make some conservative assumptions, it could still this low and then you sign what looks like a you know for example if you sign a, a mid-level contract which is tied to the you know the amount of the cap all of a sudden if the cap drops next year uh, and by next year i mean like the 21 off season then all of a sudden this mid-level contract is now you know uh, a decent amount higher as uh, relative to the salary cap where uh, it, it's intended to be sort of flat and maybe even declining in a in a situation of of increasing revenues so Larry and Seth, either of you on this one, but Seth mentioned something interesting, the broader economic picture here. How often are teams really looking at that and how that impacts things? Or is that is that a unique situation now that we're looking at? No, it happens all the time. So the league a uh, year in advance will start notifying teams. This is what we're projecting the revenue to come in at and what we expect the cap level and tax level to be for next year. And the league periodically gives updates to those numbers 
until they get to the final number on June 30th. So the, the teams have been kept apprised of that. And then they run, like, like Seth said, they, they know a high and low, you know, okay, it can, our confidence interval is that it's going to come anywhere in this range. So we're going to say it could come out with this or this, and that's what it's going to mean for us. But as Seth said, we don't even know the range or the error bars in that range are so huge. It's better to think of it in terms of there's here's three things that can happen with the economy in general, uh, an optimistic scenario, a pessimistic scenario, and then something in the middle and then have independent ranges for all three of those. So you're really running those numbers in parallel three times rather than just once in a normal situation. And so, Seth, this is somewhat unique in that the, the broader economic picture around the globe impacts these more than you would normally think. That's fair, right? Yeah, I, would, I think so. I, I do not think that uh, that that NBA teams, as a rule, uh, employ macroeconomists. So this is uh, this is uh, kind of outside the scope of what really did, I would say most people dealing, dealing with this sure. have ever really. I mean, as it is for all of us. So uh, you may be able to see if you're watching at home, Eric Pincus is is not with us right now. I can tell we're working in the background to try to get him back. But uh, we'll move on now, uh, moving ahead to the revenue gap. Obviously, it's going to hit us all. But what are your insights as to how the NBA uh, could generate additional revenue? Uh, Seth, we'll, we'll start with you. Any way, any mechanism, any creative ideas to generate more revenue to, to help make up some of that lost money? Um, I think I, I mentioned it earlier. The uh, the, um, the the new partnership with with Microsoft. I think um, I, I know Adam Silver went on uh, Ben Thompson's, uh, who's, a, who's a, a well known kind of tech uh, business writer. Uh, his, his podcast, I want to say, about three weeks ago, and he outlined um, kind of trying to figure out ways to move from a from a one to many model of of producing content for fans to a more one to one model, which is uh, I don't know if that looks like microtransactions, like with a with like an app based game, or or some kind of a la carte way to allow uh, to monetize fans, uh, kind of customizing their their engagement uh, in other ways. I think that's um, I, don't, I don't think we know what that looks like yet, but I think that's sort of one of the the the, the newer frontiers. Larry, Larry, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so Seth brought up a great point, which is that from a micro scale, you can do a lot to monetize small transactions, and those all add up, of course. But I was also going to mention that on the larger scale, like the Microsoft deal, the league makes deals, well, large deals with, with different organizations um, all the time. And there's a structure for the money coming in. So any deals coming in this year, I could see them possibly opting to front load that money. It's like, hey, we're going to have a big dip. Let's try and fill in that dip a little bit in order to make this year look as normal as possible, even though we're going to make a little bit less down the road because the money was front loaded. Now, since Eric is not on the call, uh, he always freezes up at the wrong moment. <laughs> uh, he's listening, I, Larry. I know he's listening. Okay, Eric, you froze. So and th this is Eric's idea because um, he talked to me about it a couple of days ago and we kind of talked through this. So credit goes to him on this. And this is kind of a radical idea and probably nothing. Oh, is, if he's back, there he is. I'm here. Say it. Eric, okay. I know you're listening to Larry. He, he's about to jump on your idea. I was uh, setting, I teed it up for you, Eric. Very nice. Timing. Larry. Your thoughts on an additional way to make some money perhaps for the league creatively. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you, gentlemen, for being so patient. Like we we did a run, everything was perfect, and then like literally, Bo, you come in and do your intro, and I'm like, Bo doesn't sound that great, and but yeah. I know Bo's the best, yeah. right? So it, it can't yeah. be Bo. Next thing I know, I'm kicked off. So uh, here we are. It's technology. There's the world, Larry. But uh, I'm glad I got back when I got back. Larry was about to steal my thunder. You know what I'm talking about? So. Uh, look, it, I don't know if this is the answer, and I reached out yeah, to. A number of people one of them was mark cuban and he said right now like expansion isn't on the front burner there's a lot more that they have to worry worry about right now and that's true there's a lot to figure out the last thing they're going to do right now is talk about expansion but as we get back to games and as things start to progress and they look and they see wow we're in a big hole financially for a long period of time this is going to impact us maybe even into next year, if, if there are no uh, fans in attendance to start the year, they may push it back to December. All these things, and I don't know what was discussed, but 
the idea would be if you expanded, you would bring in a significant amount of money. In theory, you would bring in the amount of a franchise. What an average franchise, according to Forbes, is about two point one billion dollars. If you brought in two franchises, you could potentially bring in four billion dollars into the revenue. Now, it's not basketball revenue, so it doesn't go to the players, but it helps the teams who might be going into debt to try to get through this difficult time. So uh, it's an idea. It dilutes uh, their piece of the pie and it's not necessarily. And Larry, I quote Larry in a story that's coming out on Bleacher Report on this, that it is a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And it's, it's very true. But I'll say that you know, Adam Silver has said multiple times that expansion is inevitable. It's going to happen. It's not happening yet. And it's not on the front burner. So if it's going to happen in three years, four years, whatever, maybe it's time to think about doing it in one year so that you can make up that income. It doesn't solve everything for the players, but it helps provide a, a cash influx. So, so teams aren't going into debt. They've got money that, that can get them through this time. Larry, you wanted to respond to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add one quick thing to that because when you collect these franchise fees from applicants, is completely different from when that team is starting to play. So they can even have the best of all worlds. If they say, oh, we were planning on expanding in 2025 or 2026, they can say, all right, we're opening the doors now. Here's the franchise fee. We're going to get the money in now. Collect, you know, get, collect that money. It goes into this year's books. It fills in that gap. The great thing about that money, like Eric said, is that it's money that doesn't go to the players. Well, so, great, great for the great for the league, not so much yeah. for the players. Real quick, I want to touch on this. It, it's an idea now. We we discussed it as an idea. How quickly, realistically, could it go from idea to we like it to let's let's start the wheels moving on this and get something done? Is how much time realistically does that take? Yeah, realistic. I mean, how quickly? How realistically? What does it take normally? Sure. Versus realistically, you know, because years of planning. Right. But realistically, in a situation like this, um, could they say uh, uh, part is just putting together the people with the money to be able to do this? I mean, they could execute something quickly. I think the hard part would be to find the people who are ready to say, OK, I'm in. Here's 200. You know, here's a two billion dollars. Let's do this. That's going to be the hard part. And I think they want to encumber that money before June 30th in order to have it um, count on, on this year's books. On the other hand, if it happens later in the year, uh, but it's coming in 2020, I don't think that that's that bad for them either. Seth, this is this is a bit, it's obviously takes us down a bit of a different course. Any reaction to, to the idea? No, I think uh, a couple of weeks ago on the on on the athletic, uh, John Hollinger and I did had had did kind of a, a back and forth, and we talked about uh, we talked about um, expansion as as kind of a solution to some other issues too. I think that um, expansion is a is an interesting way of of possibly dealing with uh, with with some of the scheduling issues. I think you can you can make up some revenue uh, in in. By, by just having a couple more teams uh, you, that, that you, you can by reducing the number of games per team, but still having kind of a similar amount of TV inventory. Um, now, it has to be split a little bit differently, but but that's still a possible option. And um, I think from from my standpoint, um, I think the player pool is certainly robust enough that uh, that uh, there, there, there are enough players that you would not be just scraping the bottom of the barrel to add, you know, 30 more guys to, to the league. You know, give it it's season. deeper than ever now, right? Yeah, definitely. And and especially depending on how, um, you know, this is we're, we're going further and further afield. But as kind of the the age discussion and the minor league discussion kind of progresses as well, um, I think those those factor in uh, to a degree. The, Larry, you wanted to respond to something, Seth? Said? Just one quick point. Um, <laughs> Forget the Sonics. We have to add a team to to Seattle and call them the Murder Hornets. <laughs> <laughs> well, the merchandising, I think, could do something. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, well, any NHL Seattle might beat you to that nickname though, because they're still uh, they're still uh, waiting to come up with their with their. Uh, the, the, the rumors abound that it's going to be the Seattle Kraken in the NF in the NHL, <laughs> but, uh, which I'm all. But uh, but you know they might pivot to Murder Hornets. Okay, but before I jump on to the next thing, best team nickname I've ever heard. There's a small town south of Atlanta called Macon that used to have a hockey team. They were called the Macon Whoopie. Fantastic. And they, they sold That's so amazing. much here. Macon Whoopie did a ton of business down there in Macon, Georgia. Okay. I like All right, that. guys. You know- uh, 
Okay, so we've talked about the, the free agency and, and what we expect to happen with the cap or what could happen with the cap. Uh, the season's in limbo. I mean, I think, I think we can all uh, accept that now. Which teams have the most to gain and which teams have the most to lose if we decide to extend or eliminate the season? Seth, I know you've got somebody in mind here. Well, I think there's the, the kind of the obvious teams at the top of both conferences would be the LA teams and and my old team, the Bucks. But I want to uh, the team that I'm that I think is more interesting is the Rockets. Um, I, I don't want. I think Larry can probably get into the sort of the the finances of it, but I think that there's it's a, sort of a, a last dance kind of feel to to their season. Uh, Mike D'Antoni is his contract ends this year. Um, uh, and but and beyond that, I think that their their path to the title was that their their kind of unprecedented going all in on on extreme small ball, and if they're still kind of in this in that honeymoon phase where they're catching teams by surprise, and if if this season kind of rolled over to next year and teams got a full season to look at it and prepare, uh, and and maybe even adjust their rosters. Um, I, I, I don't think that that kind of, um, that sort of let's get weird card, uh, ha- has as much, uh, has as much kind of surprise factor as, as it might, if, if, you know, we, the, the, if the playoffs were going now, cause you know, nobody had, you know, very few teams had even seen that. So they're, they're a team that I think, um, you know, to, they, they did some very creative moves to, to open a window that didn't look like it was there, but I think it was just a window for more than likely just for this year. And, and if they, if it doesn't happen, then, uh, then it, it, I don't think it will happen. Larry teams, you could see benefiting from the season being extended and seems teams that you see benefiting from the team, the, the season being canceled altogether. So, so go through that. Yeah, so I agree with Seth on that. I mean, in addition to to Mike D'Antoni, this possibly being the end of the line for him with Houston, that's a very expensive team. And their owner is not exactly in the perfect financial situation. He's being hit hard by this. So I could see things happening there just from a financial standpoint. From a basketball standpoint, and I know Eric was going to talk about this, but the murder hornet scared him away. Uh, (laughs) He, the Lakers, obviously, because, you know, this they have Anthony Davis with a player option this year. They could conceivably lose him. Uh, we have LeBron getting older. We, we they have a lot to prove here. You know, they were they were riding high up to the point where the season was canceled. So this could be devastating for them for they finally come back all the way. And then this happens. So when you look at, OK, what could happen? Why Why would I want to answer this question one way or another? Either the players could be either aging out or leaving. Um, you could have the coaches and Seth already covered Mike D'Antoni. Front office, maybe Toronto, you know, who's doing fine. But Fred Van Vliet is a potential free agent. And then who knows what's going to happen with Masai Ujiri in the future. Um, you could have... Um, the, the the whole thing with the end of the playoffs in the East, the six, seven, eight teams, you know, with with Orlando and all them, who's going to be in, who's going to be out, Washington. Um, this that could be a thing that one of those teams could say, yeah, I want it to end, or another one could say, no, we wanted this this season to continue. But then on the other side of it, so who might benefit from this? I mean, from a strictly basketball standpoint. Golden State, I think, can't wait for 2020 to be over. From a financial standpoint, yeah, this is the first year in the new arena, and they wanted that money coming in. But from a basketball standpoint, my God. And then Brooklyn, maybe, okay, we're going to start up again, and we have Kevin Durant back. What could be better than that? That's an interesting point. Imagine a scenario if the, the league comes back this year and the Brooklyn Nets are able to put together Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving healthy Seth, what what could an outlook be for a healthy team with Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and the rest of the crew suddenly, all of a sudden, galloping through the end of a regular season and into the playoffs? Man, Isn't that's that even fair, really. I I think that that's uh, given the nature of. I, I think the the Achilles tear is kind of demonstrably the the worst, relatively common injury a basketball player can suffer. And there is just no real track record of, of uh, you know, guy, even all-star players. Dominique Wilkins was an all-star once after he, sure. he tore his and no one else uh, has kind of gotten back. 
Um, now, you know, Durant has some, has some, uh, uh his physical size, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and and also his, just his, his his shooting ability like gives him that that uh, to get back to that. But the, for them to have like a legitimate chance, he has to be a top five player. Is that realistic this year? I think he, like best rosiest scenario, he's a top fifteen player, and that's that's you know the the, the rest of their roster has some decent players, but I don't think that's a I don't think that's enough. So, um, so you feel the same way, basically, Larry, Kevin Durant comes back and it's it's still very difficult to imagine them marching through an Eastern Conference. Yeah. I mean, does he come back like Dominique came back or, you know, Kobe's was offset by by that um, bone break. But, you know, those are success stories. Does he come back like Chauncey Billups came back? Well, he's not going to help him that much. Well, one thing I'm curious about, Seth and Larry, is if we think of the season star stopped in early March and maybe the earliest we could get back is is sometime in june that's almost like an off season and teams come back differently from season to season do you expect let's start with you seth do you expect some teams to be almost a different different identity when they come back after what serves honestly as an off season i i mean it's it's impossible not to not to think that i mean he, you know the 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 sort of the continuity of of the comfort that people have, uh, you know, not just playing, but just like the day to day routine of of you know being around each other. Um, that's you know that that is not something that you can manufacture, and uh, and you know, obviously bringing that cohesion back under these circumstances, um, you know, some teams will do it better than others, but I think expecting other every team to just like you know, snap right back in and it's, and it's routine and we're back to work. I think that's, um, I, I don't think that's realistic to expect. And I don't think that we have a really any, any real way to predict from the outset, which teams will handle that relatively better or worse than others. Cause there's any, just any number of factors that, that, that could, you know, play into that. Um, and, and, you know, whether it's, it's, you know, uh, obviously there's been some, you know, very sad stories of relatives of players, uh, sure. being affected and, and, you know, uh, on extreme of that end, um, and, and, you know, or if, if time is, has kind of healed some wounds, if there was some, you know, some, you know, I, over the course of a season, there'll be little, you know, you'll have little bicker bickering sessions about something, but, you know, that probably seems pretty trivial now. So, so maybe those things get just smoothed out naturally. So um, I, and I don't think that we, especially from the outside have any real way of making sense of, of which teams are likely to weather that recombobulation better. I think, I think Seth makes a good point, Larry, there, there's going to be new storylines when this whole thing comes back eventually. Right. Yeah, this is a multifactorial problem, right? Because on one hand, you just have the straight conditioning and people have been sheltering in place at home. And yeah, these guys are professional athletes. They're going to keep themselves in shape, but it's still going to be a bell curve to a certain extent. There are some guys who are just going to come back, be better than they were before, maybe, because all they did was spend eight hours a day in their home gym. Um, on the other hand, there might be some players who really treated it like an off season and I don't get the vacation somewhere else. So I'm just going to sit around my pool and, and drink Mai Tais all day. Day. You're, you're going to see both. Some are going to come back close to being okay. Some are not. But these guys have not played with others during this entire time. So even if they're in great game shape, they're not in the, the real kind of basketball shape that comes from banging against other bodies the whole the, the whole time. And of course, getting all the um, the coordination and getting used to each other again, it's going to be just like coming back into training camp. It's going to take some time for, it's going to take some time for coaches to adapt to what they have um, and, and figure out how, how to be working and playing everybody. So I expect it to be similar to a preseason for whatever preseason, you know, I, I hope they have some kind of abbreviated preseason, but then even the rest of whatever the regular season would be, I think that it would just be getting used to playing again. And then maybe hopefully by the time they start a playoffs, it would be something that resembles a little bit better what we come to expect from NBA basketball. Larry, one question that, that's it's interesting to me, at least, if this season goes on beyond July 1st, mm -hmm. how does the league handle extending those contracts and how does that all work? I think the league and the players association, well, there is a, 
um, a clause in the CBA. There, there's the force majeure that we all know sure. about. That, that says if there's a, a sudden drop in revenues and if games are canceled, they get to take it out of the player's paychecks. They're kind of beyond that. They're in a different clause, which is the act of God clause, right? If there is a, a sudden loss in revenue, uh, that's really substantial. It just says that the league and the union are going to negotiate together in good faith to figure out what to do about it, how to modify the rules of the CBA to accommodate this. So what's going to happen is that they're just going to come up with a, an agreement that's that's going to say, and this is the union collectively on behalf of the players doing this bargaining, just agreeing, okay, this season is going to last through whatever, August 15th, all contracts are extended through that. That's fine for the players. And I think that that's all doable. But we go back to Seth's comment about Mike D'Antoni. Coaches are not unionized. And Mike D'Antoni's contract ends June 30th. So what do you do about coaches in that situation? There could be some messiness here. Seth, one thing I, I like to end this show with every week is, look, I'm a, I'm a young student or a young person trying to get into the business of basketball, and my whole world's been turned upside down. What do I do now to put myself in the best position going forward and to take advantage of this time so that, so that I'll be ready when everything gets back to normal? Um, I mean, the the – Silver lining from that standpoint is you have time to do in-depth projects. Um, there's the, the, this question comes up a lot. Certainly in the analytics space, it comes up all the time. Like I, this is what I want to do. How do I get into it? And the answer is always the like the the way you demonstrate that you are uh, worthy and 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 should get one of these jobs is to is to act as if you already have one. Um, you know, I obviously you know. Uh, I'm sure students approach Larry all the time with their their kind of their kind of cap analysis. Uh, from my standpoint, it's uh, answer a basketball question from a from a from a statistical analysis point of view. It doesn't have to be NBA. It can be it can be college. It can be you know lower level college. It can be uh, European. It could be WNBA. It could be any level of basketball where you find that there's a knowledge gap that you can uh, sort of demonstrate both your technical skills, uh, your presentational skills, and, and then your, your ability to analyze in terms of, of, uh, of a basketball game, not just, not just uh, numbers on a spreadsheet or on a page. Um, this, is, this is time to, to get working on that. And, and you know, it's, it's never been easier to, to self-publish that kind of stuff and get it out there, get feedback on it. And, and, First of all, that'll you know put yourself out there, and second of all, it'll it'll give you a better sense of if you're any good at it or not. Um, there's there's a lot of things. I think we've all experienced a lot of things. I think I could be good at that, and then you start doing it. It's like, actually, no. There's some things I need to to know to be good at that. I don't have those yet, and and then you have to decide whether those skills are are you, whether you can acquire those skills or not. So that's um, I think that's the general advice I would give at any time, and I think. Um, a time where uh, presumably a lot of people are are kind of uh, stuck at, at, at in situations where there's less social engagement and stuff like that. Um, you've got some time and space to 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 think big about those kind of projects. All right, uh, Larry, your, your swing at that. What what would you recommend students be doing right, right now? You just have to go through me. It's impossible. <laughs> no. in, in terms of what Seth said, yes, I agree completely. And there's no sh no shortage of uh, of opportunities for people who are able to tie everything together and communicate. Right, people who can not only do the analytics but have the ability to communicate that, communicate it to front offices, communicate it to coaches, communicate it to players. Help work out. Okay, how do we change? this from data, from information I have on a screen, on paper, in diagrams, to something actionable on the court. I think that that is going to be the next huge step for people who can really do that, um, to be able to do that. Now, in terms of kind of doing what I do, you, you know, part of it is I always used to like to say that um, it's much easier to be the best when you're in a field of one. Uh, there, there really wasn't any kind of job for people who do what I do. I kind of created that. And 
you, you know, the role, the thing of a capologist, because before GMs did it or they hired outside attorneys who did it. And again, it was people, if they hired an outside attorney who did it, then it was people who understood the, the law part of it, but not necessarily how that related to what was happening on the roster, on the court, you know, within the team. And, and having the capologist who's going to be able to tie all that information together is huge. And there are more and more opportunities for people to be able to do that. Now, many teams, if not most, have their own capologists, people who can come in there and not just be the guys who say, okay, run out and tell me everybody whose salary is within this band and put together all the potential trades for this and bring me a stack of those but people who could really contribute to the narrative for the team. Here's how, how to help drive what we're doing, and this is my contribution to that. And making sure also one of the things that I try to do with what I do with Sports Business Classroom, with the executive session, with working with teams directly, is to sort of elevate that level of, of conversation so that you, you know, it's just like you have to have a certain level of basketball knowledge to be able to sit at that table and talk basketball with the coaches and the front office people. I want to get it so that everybody is at the same baseline level of, of understanding of the CBA and the salary cap implications so that when they're, and this goes to coaches, this goes to scouts, this goes to everybody, so that when they're sitting around the table and talking about this stuff, they're communicating the same language and they understand it. Um, they understand each other. And now the the CBA implications is right there with the basketball implications and the scouting implications and the coaching implications. The teams that can best integrate all that are the teams that are going to be successful going in, into the future. And I think that's where a lot of great opportunities are going to lie. Well, if you're watching at home right now, you can see across the top of your screen, SBC registration is still open. So go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com for that. Uh, Larry, just give us the, the latest. What's the lay of the land? What's going on with Sports Business Classroom? Yeah. So like the entire world, we're still in wait and see mode, right? Registration for Sports Business Classroom is still open, but we are part and parcel of the NBA Summer League. And if the NBA decides, okay, we're just going to extend the season throughout the summer and we're not going to have a summer league this year, then that affects us greatly, of course. Um, if there's going to be a summer league and it happens later, we have to adapt to that. If there's not going to be something or it's going to be so late that it overlaps the academic calendar and we're just going to lose a bunch of our target demographic, then we have to pivot and do something else. So we are exploring alternatives. We're looking at distance learning alternatives. We're looking at video course alternatives. We're about to come out with one for, for the CBA. Um, we are going to provide something for you. It's going to be something good. We're going to make, make, make lemonade out of lemons um, to the extent that we possibly can, even if it is not um, going to be the as scheduled week long immersive sports business classroom um, held at Summer League in July. All right. Thank you so much, Larry, as always. And, and Seth, thank you for jumping in as well. I know you're and the Eric. Kind of part of the SBC thing. And yeah, Eric, sort of like the letter Y for us. It's a sometimes vowel, sometimes <laughs> not. But thank you for being here, some, Eric. Uh, and thanks all of you for watching. It's the sports business classroom web show check us out on sportsbusinessclassroom.com and once again thanks for watching and there you have it i hope you enjoyed episode 21 of the sports business classroom audio experience you can find show notes for everything we discussed at sportsbusinessclassroom.com forward slash web dash show please let us know what you thought about the format and if you learned something from this episode please Share it with your friends, share it with your family, and anyone you think might be able to get something out of it. And if you really got a lot of value, please take a few minutes to review the show on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And as always, we want to hear from you. We do the show for you. So if you have any thoughts or comments, you can leave a comment on the site or send us your questions on social media by tagging us at Sports Business Classroom. Big thank you to our sponsors, Sports Business Classroom Online and Hall Pass Media. And thanks again for listening. Stay safe out there, guys. We'll see you here next week on the Sports Business Classroom audio experience.